So I would say that success is to have freedom, harmony, and love in your life. This beautiful experience we are co-creating and sharing in. At the end of the day, we're just lying to ourselves. This is an opportunity to express where your mind is at so that you can be fully present because most of the time, we're not actually real with one another. When the pain of same becomes greater than the fear of change, you open your mind and your heart to something new. I begin to question, you know, whether the things I wanted were really my true definition of success. And it, it turns out they weren't. And so then you sort of have to unwind some of that conditioning and begin to build a new relationship with yourself. So excited sitting here with Ryan Estes from Impact 11. Ryan is an incredible keynote speaker, and I got to meet Ryan and learn from Ryan earlier this year in 2022 out in Florida through what's called a boot camp, really for people trying to become, not trying, but working hard to become keynote speakers. And Ryan, someone who has been there in the trenches, someone who has even danced with medicines like ayahuasca, and someone who is speaking to corporate audiences and really change makers. So I'm so stoked to have you here, Ryan. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to see you again and a privilege to be on your show. I'm, I'm excited for the chat, brother. Yeah, let's get straight into it. So just just to let the audience know, you and I were just talking a little bit about what's been going on with your life. And I know you to a certain extent, it's not like we keep uh, close contact or anything like that, but I want to really figure out what it is that you're passionate about right now and how you got into spirituality in general. And you're just mentioning to me that you felt like you got to the top of success, kind of what you're seeking and you're looking for something more, which just like hits me in my soul because that's really what started my path of going within. So just for the audience, could you tell the audience a little bit of how you spend your days on the road, being a speaker and what your life was like before being a speaker and how that changed once you started to shift your gaze inward, which is now probably how you got into speaking. I'd love to hear the whole story and we got plenty of time. Yeah. Perfect. Well, a great setup. Um, so look, you know, I, I, I was in pursuit of, of success. I think, um, you know, I came from a family where high expectations were placed on me. I think a lot of my sort of identity and worth were attached on, you know, this idea or expectation that I was going to achieve success in life. And I was, I was pretty focused on that. And I had some success early in a sales career and I grew in that job and grew in that business. And, you know, I, I was probably a bit of a workaholic, very, very much folk focused on, you know, performance. Uh, and that was my purpose. You know, how, how much success can I achieve? How high can I go? How far can I climb? Like that was the I idea and happiness for me was partying on the weekends and having friends and working out. And there wasn't a lot of depth, uh, to those things. And I think, I think there's utility in that. I think, especially early in a career or as a young man, that sort of drive and that energy, but without a balance or depth or something that's more sustainable and that's truly meaningful and filling at a deeper level, I I, I think you're set up, set up to fail. And I, I most certainly was. And I think with a little bit of age and experience and wisdom and some disappointments, um, you know, there was sort of this idea that I was going to arrive in this place and that was going to feel really good. And the arrival kept the, the finish line or the, the benchmark, the feeling good, kept moving. It kept moving. It seemed like there wasn't a place I could get to. And then, you know, you, you experience life. Um, you know, you lose a parent and you begin to ask deeper questions, face your own mortality a little bit. You know, the end of a significant romantic relationship and then another and another. And that causes you to sort of question things about yourself and, and, and I, you know, I'm a curious person and an introspective person. And so, you know, through some of that pain and examination, I, I began to question, you know, whether the things I wanted were really my true definition of success. And it, it turns out they weren't. And so then you sort of have to unwind some of that conditioning 
and begin to build a new relationship with yourself. And I call that the work. And that was the beginning of my journey inward toward something different. And, you know, I was doing that in parallel with a new career. So to your point, you know, I left a pretty big job with a Fortune 500 company, started a speaking career and started to achieve success in that speaking career in about 2016, 2017. You know, I was at the pinnacle doing 90 dates, high fee, starting to become known in the business. And at the end of that year, I had a pretty big setback personally, and I felt very alone and isolated and almost guilty for not saying, wow, this was everything I dreamed of. But, you know, it, it was the wrong dream and reorienting myself toward a, you know, a different focus in life was was probably some of the most important work I've ever done. done. And I say this now, you know, success, outward success without inner fulfillment is the ultimate failure. And that was the path that I was on. That That's so well said in terms of not having the inner fulfillment. And that resonates with me. And I know so many other people of chasing success and, and goals and achieving and then being like, oh, I thought I'd feel different. And we see that from, you know, all sorts of champions, including Super Bowl winners. One that comes to mind is Steve Weatherford. Are you familiar with him? I am. Yep. I figured I you would be. Yeah, I know who he is. I, I can't say I, you know, I know him personally, um, but. Well, just yeah. his story for anyone that I, hasn't heard his story. Uh, he's an amazing podcaster and just leader and former Super Bowl champion kicker for the New York Giants. And he's very outspoken on a lot of, this thing, a lot of these things. For me personally, it's more spirituality. I know for him, it's more of a religious thing, but it, you know, it doesn't really matter. I think to your point, it's like what aligns with you. Now, a question I have for you is around goal setting because I actually wrote my, what was it? My second book called The Written Goal. It was all about goal setting. I published that one, I think in 2018. And I've always been someone who really finds themselves working well with goals. And obviously kind of to your point, I wasn't doing the inner work. I was chasing the dollars. I was chasing success, partying on the weekends, all the type of things. But now having been on this journey of the inner journey in the past three years, I've had so much resistance to goal setting. And there's a few reasons why, and there's a few different ways that I've gone about it. But I'm curious from you, how has kind of going within changed the way you approach goals? And this is so timely going into the new year as well. Yeah. So look, I, I still run a couple of business or I'm involved in a couple of businesses and we do planning and we have targets and benchmarks and, and that's all great. And it's useful, particularly if you have a team of people around you, but I, I'm not as nearly as oriented to financial success as, as I once was. In fact, in my own speaking practice, my goal next year is, is to do about what I did this year, which, you know, that that's like as a former sales leader and a guy that's supposed to be growing a company, but what that's going to do, it's going to create room for the other goals I have, which is deepening my spiritual practice, which is being kinder to myself, which is making time in nature, which is taking time off, which is spending time in community and investing time in my family. And, you know, I have I have more balanced priorities and, and almost what I would describe as a different definition of success. So, you know, my business and the work I do, that's one aspect of me, but it doesn't define the total of me. You know, Ryan, the speaker is a part of me, but that isn't the center of Ryan. That's my job. And I want to do great in my job. I want to perform well at my job. My job is important. I think my job is an opportunity for me to serve and create impact. And that's a beautiful thing, but it's not, it doesn't define my whole existence. Yeah, absolutely. And what does your spiritual practice look like on a daily basis, especially someone who is traveling doing 60 gigs plus a year? It's a great question. And, and so there's a, I haven't talked about this, but there's, so there's a vision of, of what it was like, and then there's the reality. And I think to your point, as we you know, as I'm busy traveling over 100 nights a year and stacked full of obligations and involved in different businesses, it, it's easy for things that are priorities to fall away. A spiritual practice, for example. Well, I'll, I'll meditate tomorrow, right? I'll, 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 I'll make up for it this weekend. Health and wellness, you know, the food you're putting in your body, exercise. 
it's easy to sort of push those things away and deprioritize them as important. And what I found um, works better for me, it's less than goal setting, but systems of accountability. So I just, I, I have to have experts around me supporting me in, in this work. And so uh, that looks like working with a life coach and a spiritual advisor. That looks like hiring somebody who's an expert practitioner in yoga and inner work and self-study and having those people on my team, you know, to hold me accountable and create and create sort of, I call it systems of accountability and a trainer too. So I'm, I'm booking time. I'm investing in myself. I'm investing in them, but that's an investment in me. And then that elevates the probability that I'm going to create room in my life to embrace these practices. Um, but this year, you, you know, this year it looked like time in community, some retreats, uh, and then working one-on-one -on -one with an advisor or life coach. Um, and I want to, I'm going to make a bigger commitment into that next year. Nice. Nice. I love it. What would you say would be like some of your deepest desires, not like personal desires for Ryan or the ego or anything like that, but really for the collective and the state of humanity and the trajectory of where we're going on this planet. Yeah. So let me, so, you know, I had, we talked a little bit about sort of my entree into this and this sort of old way of viewing what success was. It was outwardly expressed. Mm -hmm. It had a lot to do with my performance and, and certainly money. Let, let me give you this new, and I'll credit this definition, but it's my new working definition. And so I would say that success is to have freedom, harmony, and love in your life. Love for yourself, your work, other people, and this beautiful experience we are co-creating and sharing in. If you have those things, it'll fall into place. And so the degree that I can cultivate that inside myself and then ultimately serve and share that with others, I, I think that's a, a, a much more rewarding path uh, and, and a much more fulfilling way to experience life. And so, you know, I, I call that living from your center and at your center, you realize we're all the same. Mm -hmm. I am you, you're me, we're all connected. Right. And you, you know, the ego wants to sort of separate us and compare us, but at, at the center and the truth is, you know, we're, we're all here experiencing this together and the degree that we can embrace that and you know, drop the judgment and the criticism and open our hearts into a shared experience. I think the better, the better my experience will be and the better anybody I come in contact will be as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And what's coming up for me is the opportunity that you have in terms of being someone that's speaking to the NBA, for example, or massive corporations and business leaders. How are you bringing this message and kind of being the bridge, if you will, and not going too far. Like, how do you really use that discernment in your speeches to inspire people through this message? Thoughtfully and carefully. I would say I do it through examples. I would, I do it through storytelling and I do it through exercises and experiences. You know, even, even something as simple as a, a bit of a visualization, you know, having people with their hand on their heart, breathe into their heart, and visualize someone or something they can be extremely grateful for, no matter what they're going through their life. You know, just a five minute exercise like that in a ballroom with a bunch of executives, you know, many of whom have never had a moment like that mm -hmm. um, be begins to soften and you can do it in partnership. You can do it through exercise. So I, I say thoughtfully, you know, um, it's interesting. I did a podcast recently um, with the Hoffman process, which was a, it's a beautiful retreat center, a personal growth center. And we talked about this idea of being the bridge between these two worlds, you know, and I, I believe the more that the more we can sort of know ourselves, heal and transform. Uh, I, I believe that the better leader we're actually able to be that leadership is very much an inside out uh, process. It's about, you know, humility and self awareness. And as those things grow, I think we have an opportunity to be better servants in this world. I couldn't agree more in terms of the Hoffman process. You mentioned that before too. So it's a center. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, I, I think probably the best, the best way to describe it is it is it's an eight day residential personal growth retreat. 
Mm. Uh, it was sort of my first entree into anything that would be described as inner work and spirituality, but uh, it's it's beautifully curated and it's and it's deep work. You know, you you drop into this retreat site and you, there's no technology. You give them your phone upon checking in. And so, you know, for eight days, uh, you leave reality and enter a new world that they curate and cultivate very thoughtfully, very carefully by design. Um, and it's it's real work. Um, you know, you're there all day and I didn't know anybody. It was a group of strangers or at this retreat site in Napa Valley, California. It was a big commitment. To, and, and you think it's probably the first time in 20 years I'd stepped out of my life in technology for yeah. eight days to sit and focus on myself. Um, but it was the beginning of a pretty significant evolution and transformation in my life. No, oh, can you speak more to that? Yeah, you know, I, I think it was the beginning of uh, I think it was the beginning of creating more awareness around why I felt the way I felt, where those feelings, those patterns, that conditioning comes from, tracing it all the way back to my family of origin and my childhood. And, you know, a way of being at seven years old to survive and receive love from, let's say, my parents, it may have served me at six or seven, but at 46 or 47, you know, those behaviors, those patterns, those conditioning may not be the way I want to be in the world and understanding you're not your patterns and that you have agency over, you know, your choices, your thoughts, your feelings and behavior was really a gift for me. And I think connecting to myself, to spirit. Uh, getting to know myself better. It was just, a, it, it was very experiential. So it wasn't just classroom learning. It was deep, deeply focused on the experience. You know, if you want, I did a podcast with them recently. If you want to link to it in the show notes, I wrote an article about it too. Those are where people could go and learn more. Um, but it was a real great jumping off point to sort of re reestablish a new kind of relationship with myself. All right. Awesome. Yeah, I'll get that podcast and article. We'll talk offline, guys. So by the time you're listening to this, you can just tap the show notes and you'll be able to listen to that podcast and article. That definitely sounds super fascinating. I mean, that's the world I've been living in, right? Going the deep, deep, deep dive and now soul life balance, right? Rather than work life balance, putting yourself first and foremost while realizing work is part of life. There's something of fascinating that's coming up right now. Have you seen uh, the show on Apple TV called Severance or heard of it? I haven't seen it. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've heard of it. I've seen it on my Apple TV, um, but I haven't watched it yet. Maybe I should, I guess you're recommending it, huh? I mean, it's an interesting show. It's kind of like one of those shows where I kind of feel kind of gross and worse after watching it. So I wouldn't say I really per se like it, but I find the concept fascinating. And I watched a few episodes or I think I watched the whole season in the spring or early summer. So it's a while ago, but basically the whole premise is they sever a connection like in your neural pathways in the brain to, so that when you go to work, you know nothing about your personal life. And then when you're living at home, you don't know anything about your work life. And to me, I was like, wow, I've been talking about soul life balance. I just wrote this book about soul life balance. I'm speaking about soul life balance. And I've been saying that we don't have a personal life and a work life. And I just loved how the show depicts it so clearly, because I think that's language and just the ways we think of like, oh, at work, I have to show up and be this way. And then my personal life, I have to be this way, this way. And they're different. And at the end of the day, we're just lying to ourselves. And something that I teach when I speak in front of audiences, specifically corporate, is this acronym called WIFL. Have you heard of that? I have not. So it's a way to start a meeting before you actually start the meeting and the acronym stands for what I feel like expressing. And the basic idea is like, I'm, this isn't a counseling session. This isn't therapy hour or anything like that, but say you just had an issue with your spouse or you got the kids late to school or something, whatever's on your mind, you have something going on later. This is an opportunity to express where your mind is at so that you can be fully present because most of the time in a corporate setting or just in life, we're not actually real with one another. So that's one thing that I found is working in terms of like giving that little bit of advice to 
corporate leaders. I'm curious from you, someone who is doing this deep, deep work, eight days, no phone, experiential activities, uh, going back to inner child healing and all these sorts of things, medicine ceremonies include, how are you bringing these type, maybe not those type of modalities, but really like giving tangible exercises to the leaders that you're working with. Sure. I mean, we, we talk about, you know, things like purpose and relationships and vulnerability and psychological safety and trust and, and love. And, you know, these are tenants of being able to lead in the, in the, truest most authentic way and i i i'm deeply aligned with you know with your shared truth about this idea of congruence and integration you know in order to trust somebody we have to know them and know that they have our best interest in mind and that means showing up as your most authentic self wherever you are in the world and so you know i i teach through storytelling examples experiences and exercises and and as I've gone on this journey, incorporating more of myself in, in my story and my experience into my work. So I, I would say that's sort of the framework. But, you know, we I'm coming out with this new book and, you know, we have nine tactics for being a, a more human centered leader. And the tactics very much are, are built around developing deep, meaningful relationships with the people around you. And um you know, I, I think for too long, too many leaders were conditioned to focus on, you know, performance and profitability and the, the, the other things. And but when you put people first and you build these relationships, you know, performance follows. And it's, it's something I try to embody and lead by example on my team and my company and the work I'm doing. And it's something I also hope to or aspire to bring to the platform, too. That's amazing. Are any of these tactics something you could share with us, or are you kind of waiting for the book to come? No, I, I, I'll, I, I don't mind. I don't mind sharing a, a couple at all. Here, here's a simple one. You know, go for coffee, and and it's it's go for coffee, and you know we're, we're working remotely and virtually now, but the idea of going for coffee is setting up a cup, two or three drop-in coffee meetings each and every week where you can sit with someone and connect and learn about them and ask questions. Too many leaders push back on that as, you know, I don't have time. I want to be respected. I'm not everybody's friend, but, but, you know, we minimize our opportunity to build relationships and to truly understand what's at somebody's core. What are their hopes, dreams, values? You know, what do they aspire to achieve in this life and being able to mentor, counsel, guide, and invest in helping someone become more of who they're capable of being. That's leadership. It's not a job. It's a responsibility. And it's not about us. It's about helping someone else become more of who they're capable of being. But you can't do that if you don't make the investment of time. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, that that's an example. And then we talk about things like transparency, decision making, teamwork, culture, you know, some of these core tenets that may seem soft, but they're actually the things that are getting missed and overlooked. And then you see things like the great resignation and quiet quitting and 70% of people are disengaged and 75% of people are distracted and you know, overwhelm anxiety and stress is on the li- on the rise and 50% of people are thinking about, you know, finding another job next year. And it doesn't have to be that way. All of that is a leadership crisis and we can solve it one person at a time. Leadership crisis. I love that. I wrote that down because that is so true. And there's something that's coming up for me that I can't, I just got to talk about breath work. Have you done a breath work journey? I have. So there's, um, and, and I'll actually, I actually just did for our Impact 11 community um, last week, I did a, a virtual session called um, Self-Care Habits of a Speaking Road Warrior. And we did five minutes of breath work in the session. We all virtually just dropped in and we started breathing together. And then we talked about how we felt afterwards. And that was a beautiful experience and a beautiful practice. I have a uh, I live in Minneapolis and there are two friends of mine, Dr. Matt and Dr. Andy, they, they own a company called breath house. And I, you know, I didn't know, honestly, I didn't know how to breathe until I met them. Literally. I was like shallow breathing, breathing into my chest. 
and they got, did some guided breath work with me. Uh, and it's a new practice, but I was so blown away. I asked Andy, I said, could you record, you know, a five minute video that guides me through a simple breath work practice that one, I can do when I'm on the road or two, I could share with my audiences. And he said, mm-hmm. of course, and did it. And so I use that now. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I do something similar in my talks. Obviously, I'm just getting started totally different scale than you. But when you're talking about your guide visualization, I teach yoga, I lead men's groups, things like that. So I do about five minutes as as well. And it's a little bit of a guide visualization more in meditation, I would say, but include box breathing. And it's so funny to me. I don't want to say funny, but it's fascinating to me when I look at the eyes of the people and they come back and you see some tears, you see some red eyes, you see some, all this type of stuff. And I'm so used to doing like really, really, really deep work. It's like, whoa, <laughs> just looking at like the five minutes because totally different audience. And I personally just went through a breathwork facilitator training with my partner, Jamie, and she's a, she's actually a self-care specialist. That's what she wrote a book on self-care and everything. So she does things like that. But uh, it's interesting, the breathwork journeys, like the 60 minutes of nonstop breathing, no medicine, nothing else involved, just you and your breath and releasing the stored trauma in the body. And when we went through the training, I was speaking with the founder of Somatic Breathwork, Stephen Jaggers, and he does some corporate type uh, breathwork, uh, not ceremonies, but sessions, I guess you could say. And it's so fascinating to go that deep in a business environment, like 60 minutes of breathing where people are screaming, they're, they're crying, maybe they're laughing, whatever comes out, but they're releasing trauma stored in the body. And to me, like that gives me a lot of hope in terms of our society, because yeah, I think it's nice to talk about more accessible things in a business setting, but I really would love to see leaders like how you and the leaders at Impact 11 go so deep with each other. So this is very long winded, but you know this audience better than me, like corporate, right? Like what are your thoughts on bringing something like a breathwork journey, a 60 minute breathwork journey where we're releasing trauma, screaming and crying? Do you think that's too much in a corporate setting or what are your thoughts? Like anything else, it depends, right? And and so, you know, there are nuances to that. And so, um, look, I mean, I I appreciate your comments. And and here's my truth. You know, um, know, when the pain of saying becomes greater than the fear of change, you open your mind and your heart to something new. And, you know, at the onset of moving toward what I would describe as inner work or spiritual practice, I was I was out of my comfort zone and pretty overwhelmed. But, you know, I kept reminding myself what I'm doing isn't working. And so if there's another path or if somebody I know, trust, care about, respect said, look, this is something that could help you or I did this, then I I I opened my mind to listen. And, you know, I think any any like anything else, you know, for this work to take hold or to transform someone, you have to be receptive. You have to be ready and and willing to try and, and put yourself in it. So to the degree that you've got a team or a leadership group or an audience, you know, that is is somewhat open and receptive. And I think people are becoming more open. You know, mm-hmm. the idea of, you know, the, the kind of work we're talking about, spiritual work, healing, you know, breath work, meditation, you know, there is there is a movement and an expansion of this work. And you see it happening in society. More people are writing about it. It's more accessible online. More podcasts are available about it. More centers are opening up. And I, I think that's all wonderful because it gives people an outlet to, you know, reconnect with themselves at their essence, who they who they truly or really are at their center. And, you know, that's a good thing. But like anything else, you know, my entry, my entree into this or my way of ma- bridging the gap between these two worlds is to make it accessible. So we may breathe for five minutes and do some box breathing and then talk about how we feel and whether that was useful or not. Right. So I think um, we're seeing more examples of that. And I, th- I think that's exciting. 
Yeah, definitely. So talk with us a little bit more about your upcoming book next spring, Prepare for Impact, because I believe you started your YouTube show, Prepare for Impact, uh, around the time of the pandemic. Is that, is what, is that correct? It is. Um, we sort of rebranded it. I mean, I had been doing this newsletter and that series of videos actually probably back. We just didn't call it Prepare for Impact. So, but we just did, did a rebranding. And as the, at the time I started working on the book, there, there wasn't a title. And um, when we finished the book and it just hit me, I said, you know, we already have the title and that's what it is. And, and the book's a story. It's, it's, a, it's a narrative. Um, my brother participated as the co-author. He is uh, the chief, chief, um, I'm not the chief executive vice president of business operations for the, the Dallas Cowboys. We wrote the book together. So it's a story. It's a story about brotherhood, business building and leadership, which we've been talking about today in the service of others. And we sort of unveiled my, my 30 steps to sales success. That's the first half of the book. We talk about the origin story of that and our relationship. And then the second half of the book are, you know, we talk about human centered leadership and some of these tax tactics to be a more, you know, people focused, human centered leader. So I'm proud of it. I, I hope people like it. Uh, we had a lot of fun writing it. It was sort of a trip down memory lane. Mm -hmm. And then I think forced us to look toward the future. Um, but it's uh, yeah, it, it was a big lift. Uh, and it, but I'm, I'm glad the project's done and I'm excited to share it with the world. So. Yeah, that sounds really special to be able to write a book with your brother and just the process in that I could imagine being uh, definitely very personal and just just interesting, a good way to come together and really share your wisdom. I think that's amazing. You said your brother is uh, work. What's his title at the Cowboys? Yeah. Executive Vice President of Business Operations. He, he essentially helps run the business of the Cowboys. He doesn't do anything with the the, the team or the players, but you know he's involved From, in yeah. in the revenue and the business operations. Very cool, Jerry World out there. That's exact. Yeah, that's exactly right. They they've got a pretty compelling business. So uh, <laughs> so yeah, and it and it you know it it is personal. It's a personal account of our story, our relationship our origin and our, you know, sort of the work we do. So, Yeah. Can't wait to read it. That's amazing. You also mentioned uh human centered leadership. And I know that's something that we've been talking about this entire podcast. You had a really good saying in terms of leadership crisis. So I think it's really important not to belabor the point and keep going further, but I did write down a note effective communication during a crisis. I found that as a sub bullet in one of the talks you give. And I think this is something that we could all use help with, whether whatever area areas in our life, are there some tips you can share in terms of effective communication during a crisis? Yeah, I, I think, I think clarity is real important. Uh, I, I think consistency is another important uh, thing, particularly during a crisis. Be clear, tell the truth. Even if you don't have all the answers, say you don't have all the answers. If you don't know what the next play is, say you don't know what the next play is. If you're trying to figure it out, tell people, but communicate. Um, and if there's bad news, uh, communicate the bad news. Um, people deserve the truth. Um, they expect transparency. And I think as leaders, we have a responsibility to deliver that. Consistency counts too. Over communicate during a crisis, check in, drop in, one-on-one -on -one teams, town halls, make yourself accessible. You know, it's interesting to think we have all of these tools and technology, more channels to communicate than at any time in history. And yet employees report they're starving for more consistent communication from mm -hmm. senior leaders. And so, you know, I, I, think that's, I think that's really, really important. So clarity, consistency, I think, I think courage is important too. You have to face the truth, the reality of the situation. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't pretend. Don't make believe. And then I, I think confidence uh, is is another one. Um, you know, and I, I think a lot of leaders lost their confidence over the last couple of years, to be quite honest. But during a crisis, people are looking at you, and it is your responsibility and your opportunity to step step forward. And the last one I'll say is, be, be calm. You know, just just relax. If it, you know, people, people can sort of feel like if you're uncertain and freaking out and over, like, just relax, thoughtfully consider, hey, and choose your words because people are holding on to that and it's meaningful. So I think those are a few tips I'd have for, you know, 
communicating during a, a challenging time. And look, we're we're in it. You know, we ca- we came out of the pandemic, and you know, we felt pretty good for a minute. And all of a sudden, there's this economic turbulence, and you know, reimagining work, and the Great Recession, and or the Great Resignation, and now we're heading into a recession, and there's a lot of you know headwinds coming in 2023, and real estate market completely. You know, there's all these things, and so people are people are looking for leadership as sort of a guide, guiding you know central force during times like this, and and I think those are some ideas for how to make sure that you know you're communicating in a way that people will respond to. So you run a boot camp for aspiring and current keynote speakers, along with your partners at Impact 11. I went through it. It's amazing. Highly recommend it for anyone that's interested in starting a speaking career, deepening your speaking speaking career. That said, if you were to start a boot camp for leaders to help with this leadership crisis, what would be some of your top tools that you would really want these leaders to go through and take all of like the HR stuff out of the way? Like just like from a personal spiritual point of view, like what would be the top things that you could recommend for leaders? Yeah, I think I think one of the keys is self-awareness. It's really developing and deepening your relationship with yourself. When you know yourself and you know who you are and what you stand for in this world and what you value, I think you're able to show up in a way um, that other people will respond to. And so I think a big part of that type of work would be sort of Helping helping leaders understand, um, you know who who they are, and then getting clear getting clear on how how they want to lead. I do this exercise. It's called establishing a PLV or a personal leadership vision, and you know we help leaders answer big questions like you know what kind of impact you, do you want to have? How do you want to be remembered as a leader? You know what's most important to you in this role and establishing a vision of who you want to be as a leader and creating a, you know, a manifesto, a statement, you know, or, around that sort of a true North, because I, I think, I think when things get hard or there's conflict and tension, it's easy to sort of default um, to our conditioning, but having sort of that, that vision statement of, yeah, that this is who I am when I'm my best self Um and this is how I'm going to help others. I, I think that's a tool that, you know, leaders can hold on to in the best and the worst of times. So those would be a couple of the things that I would, I would, I would think about. And then, you know, it's just also learning too about other, other people and human nature, how people want to be treated, how people want to be led. Cause it isn't about you in that job. Mm-hmm. And awareness. I couldn't agree more. I think that's the biggest thing. And just to, have a moment of vulnerability and share with you and the listeners here. I moved in with my partner and her soon to be six-year-old daughter and my seven-year-old golden retriever over there in the couch behind me, if you're watching on YouTube. And the it's been just about two months right now. And it has been so hard for me. Like things are good. Everything's good. Uh, but at the same time, it's a whole new lifestyle combining two households and just the kid energy, partner energy from someone who's been like my dog and I for the past probably five years or so. Um, what, what, what do you, can I, let me ask you a question. What, what's been hard about it? Like if you put a thing, can you put a finger on? Like, yeah, you, no, I know ex- it's the pace of life. I've, I've gotten so slow at how I move meticulous. And that's why I brought this up because awareness, I've been very aware of everything. And the pace of life at which we go now is just so fast that, yeah, my message is soul life balance. And I see the, the cosmic giggle, the cosmic joke in it all of your mess is your message. Cause what do I need most is soul life balance. And where do I go and retreat back to the life and leave my own inner work and spirituality behind in a situation like this, where it's like, now it it's, it's just, It's finding those times of when I can build in back my spiritual practices. And even within the storm, when we're racing to get uh, the little one to school on time, or, you know, she can't find whatever it is and, ah, you know, just loud noises and fast speed, just maintain my own 
center amidst the storm, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, you're in the midst of a pretty significant life, life adjustments, you know, because your, your circumstances, your environment, your sense of place is changed and you're going to have to reorient yourself probably to a new way of moving through that adjustment until sort of it calms down and you get the, you know, the new rhythm and the new pace of things in the new environment down. Uh, that's a very significant life change. So it would, yeah, it certainly makes sense that through that transition, it's a little, it's a little awkward and bumpy. Yeah, I totally get it. And I think the biggest thing in anything is really awareness. And it's just interesting to going back to my fast pace, because I used to be very fast and COVID, the lockdowns were invitation for all of us to slow down. And some chose to slow down, some to met chose to meet it with a resistance. I don't care which side you're on in terms of if you think it's all a conspiracy or if you think you should be wearing two masks or a mask in the car or whatever, like there's fear on both sides. And then there's others that are just whatever it is. Right. And I was one of those that used it, looked at it as an invitation to slow down. And I feel like I very much mastered that. Uh, but in terms of bringing the message and the tools and modalities to leaders to slow down like a lot of times the reason why they are going so fast whether it be the work culture or the home life it could be either and or both so it's very hard to navigate when you already have that external type of pressure um say for a leader that's got bigger leaders on top that may not be on board right yeah yeah, look, I mean, you know, you're you're talking about, I think, a question we all wrestle with, which is balancing, you know, our responsibilities and priorities and, and you know, as people, what our true nature calls us toward. And COVID, as tragic as it was, I, th I think the way you sort of described it is right. It, it could have served, and I think it did for many, myself included, as an, in, as an invitation to ask bigger questions. And, you know, maybe some of these habits or the pace of things or there were things we were pursuing that really aren't worth pursuing. You know, I, I was able to sort of pause, reflect deeply and make some adjustments in my life. And I, I've seen a lot of other people do that, too. And, you know, it's human nature to sort of get the gravity sort of pulls us back into what we know and what's familiar and, the you know, the speed on the treadmill is getting turned up. Oh, we're going back up to seven. Now we're at eight. Let's see if we can get back up to 12 where we were in 2019. It's impossible. Why? And, and, you know, you stop and you say, what's really important? And what do I really want? And, you know, it's like the rocking chair exercise. Like when I'm 80 years old and I'm in the rocking chair and I look back on it, you know, what, what was important and, and just sort of orienting our us. We all have responsibilities and things and, you know, and pressure and, and that we have to deal with. And that's true. But worrying, orienting ourselves to, to your point where we bring awareness to our choices and learning how to say no and learning how to balance that and, and reprioritizing to what matters. That's an individual choice. But the awareness piece is key. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Ryan, this has been awesome. So incredible. So many great nuggets. And I'm going to, I wrote down a ton of timestamps. There was a quote um, probably about 20 minutes ago. I'll go look it up because that was an awesome quote. And I, it's trying to stay engaged. But thank you so much for taking the time to be on this podcast, for the work you do for yourself, for your team at Impact 11, for aspiring speakers for corporate leaders and to rewrite the narrative. I am so pumped for your book, Prepare for Impact in the spring of 2023. Thank you so much for coming on the Soul Seeker Podcast. Thank you, Sam.